The readings today are about the fundamentals, the very heart of religion, the tradition of the elders. Keeping track of rules and regulations can be confusing, but the letter of James cuts right to the heart. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orphans and widows. God's concern for the most vulnerable becomes present in us when we mirror God's concern and make God's present visible. The way James sees it, it's the doing that matters. Besides disagreements about what's important in our tradition, it turns out there's confusion about the word religion itself. The confusion is not in English, actually, but in the Latin that's used. The word religio has different meanings in Latin. Cicero thought that the word came from the verb religere, to reread or go over a text, religion being a body of custom and law that demands study and transmission. A Christian writer in the early 4th century opted for religare, a verb meaning to fasten or bind. When Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes. That's a sign that he was loved and cared for. Giving children boundaries and setting rules are a sign of parental love. This is how the author of Deuteronomy views the law. For what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call to him? And what other great nation has statutes and ordinances as just as this entire law that I'm setting before you today? St. Augustine suggested yet another possibility, re elegere to choose again. Jack Castlow used to say that the whole story of the Bible can be summed up in three words, call, fall, and recall. This is the idea at the heart of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a retelling of the Exodus story during the Babylonian exile. Jerusalem is in ruins. The whole system has collapsed, and the people have been exiled from the promised land. Today's first reading is a sermon placed in the mouth of Moses. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land that the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. So the land is a gift, but the people of Israel must keep their part of the covenant in order to occupy and live in the land. When Israel is faithful to the covenant, they will occupy the land. But when they turn to idolatry, the land will be taken from them. Deuteronomy is written when the land has been taken away from the children of Israel and they're exiled in a foreign land. Everything they cared about has collapsed. All the externals of their religion are gone. With nothing left, the children of Israel had to rely only on the Lord. And here's the remarkable thing. It was during that time of captivity that Israel had a spiritual reawakening. It was really the time when Israel became finally a faithful people. Just as the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, so God, too, leads us into the wilderness. Because it's only in that emptiness, in the stillness, that we can hear God speak. I will put my law within you. I will write it on your hearts. Today, God is leading the church once again into the wilderness The sexual abuse crisis is forcing us to confront the failed practices that are not giving life. In the wilderness, we must learn to rely on God, the God who alone can lead us to a place where we cannot go on our own. After 25 years of priesthood, Henri Nouwen experienced a crisis of faith that he wrote about in his book, 
in the name of Jesus. Nouwen was a very popular Catholic spiritual teacher. He was a very successful author and international speaker. Everyone was saying to him that he was doing really well. But something inside him was telling him that his success was putting his own soul in danger. So Nouwen retired from Harvard Divinity School, and he went to live at L'Arche. L'Arche is French for the Ark. It's a place where both physically able and severely handicapped people live together in mutual community. It was at L'Arche that Nouwen's whole world was turned upside down. He was suddenly faced with his naked self, open for affirmations and rejections, hugs and punches, smiles and tears, all dependent simply on how he was perceived at the moment. These broken, wounded, and completely unpretentious people forced Nouwen to let go of what he considered his relevant self, the self that can do things and show things, prove things, build things, and forced him to reclaim that unadorned self in which he was completely vulnerable, open to receive and give love, regardless of any of his many accomplishments. The church today is being called in the very same way to listen to the voices of those who have been abused, whom we have failed to protect. It is these wounded ones who will lead us into new life. Now one points to the story of, in chapter 20 of John's Gospel. Peter has failed in leadership three times. He denied Jesus. But now Peter has come face to face with his own sinfulness. And ironically, it is then that he is ready for leadership. Instead of abandoning him, Jesus chooses Peter again. Three times he asks, Peter, do you love me? And each time he commands, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. Nouwen writes, from that heart come the words, do you love me? Knowing the heart of Jesus and loving him are the same thing. When we live in the world with that knowledge of Jesus' heart, we cannot do other than bring healing, reconciliation, new life, and hope wherever we go. After this exchange between Jesus and Peter, Jesus said to Peter, When you were younger, you used to fasten your belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. This, of course, is exactly the opposite of the way of the world. When we were young, we were dependent, could not go wherever we wished. But when we grow old, we can make our own decisions, go our own way, and control our own destiny. Now one says that Jesus has a different view of maturity. It's the ability and willingness to be led where we would rather not go. The servant leader, now and says, is the leader who is being led to unknown, undesirable, and painful places. This way always leads us to the cross. But now and concludes, it is this, the oldest, most traditional vision of Christian leadership, of the leader with outstretched hands who chooses a life of downward mobility that awaits realization in the future.